thy hand has made I see the stars and I hear the rolling thunder thy power through Joy shall fill 
lift your hands and sing that. Oh, I am. Sing it with all your heart. I exalt. Oh, Lord. Just one more time. Just one more time. Lift it now. Jesus, I exalt Thee, oh Lord. Ha <laughs> ha, we worship you, sir. Would you lift your hands? Lifting hands is a way of saying, God, I'm not smart enough to guide my life. I need you. And you're taking your human pride and you're chunking it. You're giving it away. And you're saying, God, would you do that with me? Just hold your hand, lift your hands up in front of you. And just tell him, Lord, I need you today. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you in the middle of all the mess the world is in. Underneath us are the everlasting arms. And we never get so low that you can't lift us up. We're not living by our wits, our wisdom, our strength. We're living by our confidence in you, sir. And we just want to say thank you with our hearts. We exalt you and worship you. Lord, I pray that every person in this building would uh, step up another level in their fellowship with you. For those that don't know you, I pray that they would come to you. Those that have known you and walked away, got, out, got involved in things that drew them away, draw them back. Lord, people watching online, I pray that the hand of God would move upon them and they would sense your presence and their need for you and acknowledge Jesus and let him rule them. Hallelujah. We just give thanks. We just give thanks. Glory. You know, I give myself away. I, uh, I turned 65 uh, last weekend. <clears throat> you know, you reach after you go through the decades of life. I just I have a great memory for whatever reason. I can remember being in the single digits. I can remember all the way back to being a year and a half old. And then in my teens, my twenties, my thirties, my forties, my fifties now, midway through the sixties, you know what I figured out? Absolutely the most important thing you'll ever do in life is give your life to Jesus. You can't take your money with you. You can't take your house with you. You can't take your car with you. You can't take uh, your, 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 your likes on Facebook with you and Instagram and whatever you do. But you know what you can't take with you? You can take your faith with you. Isn't that good? And you know what else you can take with you? The only thing you'll take in heaven to heaven with you is your relationships. Huh? Now, I've been asking the Lord about Susan because I, I, I want us to be married in heaven. You know, because I want her to live in my place. Will you live in my place in heaven, Susan? Because I've been my life with her, you know. The only thing you take is your relationships. Amen. Amen. You know, let me talk a minute. Um, this thing with Israel, everybody's got their eyes on it, right? Now, I uh, gave a whole lesson on it Wednesday night. So if you didn't hear that, you weren't here, it's online. I did notice it got quite a few notices on Facebook and whatever. But uh, let me just talk about that a second because um, people are misconstruing what's happening. This is not the end of the world. Did you hear what I just said? Let me go further and say the battle of Armageddon is not about to happen. Not yet. World situations aren't ready yet. According to what the Bible says, the life will be like it's not quite ready for all that to happen. Now, it's coming. But I, I just noticed looking around and listening to what people are saying. Some people thinking Jesus is, I don't think Jesus is coming back yet. He's coming, but not quite yet. Now, if I'm wrong on the way up, I'll say, you were right, I was wrong. But just hear me out. But here's what I do know. Psalm 122, 6 says this. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. 
Hmm. And then, you know, the next few verses of Psalm 122 says, O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls, prosperity in your palaces. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, may you have peace. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek what is best for you, O Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem in the Bible called the city of the great king. You know, there's, uh, there's going to be a, a new Jerusalem come out of heaven. It's a huge, I don't quite understand. It's going to be a cube that comes down from heaven 1,500 miles wide, deep, and high. And uh, you're going to be living there one day. Is that exciting? It's kind of strange. That's what the Bible, right, Bible says. So, somewhere right above where Jerusalem is now. So, so you don't mess with what God likes. So I'm just going to say this, and you do what you want to with it. Uh, God loves Israel. God loves the Israelites, even though they haven't acknowledged him. A lot of them have not. Only Messianic Jews know Jesus as Savior. But God loves that nation because he gave it to Abraham. He gave that parcel of land to Abraham. It's a big fight. The Palestinians say, well, it was ours. It's never been theirs. They've never been a nation. So what my brother just says, true, uh, uh, Israel will never leave that land. So let me say this, they will never be defeated by their, they'll never be destroyed and moved off that land. Now they'll be attacked, but they won't be destroyed. Now you just got to know that because I'm hearing all kinds of stuff, right? So, so with all the things people are saying, you want to err on the side of, uh, of who's going to win. And I tell you, you want to err on the side of what God likes. So how many want to like what God likes? So... God likes and loves the nation of Israel. They're in sin, they're in unbelief, and they need Jesus. I've been there. I, my eyes struck out on stems, on, I, I did, stems at what I saw. I thought, wow, man, these people need God bad. But you know what? God loves the Israelites because Jesus came from there, right? So can we pray for them before we do anything else? Lord, we pray uh, for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for uh, your hand on uh, your natural people for which came our uh, Messiah, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for them that the hand of the Lord would come upon them. And Lord, may they come to see Jesus as Messiah, Savior, in Jesus' name. Father, work a work in them in the name of Jesus. And bring to pass all of the prophecies that that have been given through your Old Testament prophets, uh, through John, uh, John, the Apostle John, through Peter, through Paul, through Jesus, you know, through the Old Testament prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah and uh, Joel and Zechariah, and Malachi, Obadiah, could name all of them. Let your word come to pass. And Lord, give us wisdom as we go through this era of time. That, Lord, we seek first the kingdom of God and get our eyes off of the distractions. They're everywhere. And we pray for the nation of the United States of America. And we just ask, God, have mercy on this great land. And we ask forgiveness for forsaking you and turning to idols in all kinds of ways. Forgive us. And let the mercy of God come once again. Lord, let there be spiritual renewal here in the midst of all that's coming. In Jesus' name. Lord, in this service, minister life to us. And we commit our time to you. You agree with all that? We always pray for another church. If you'll stick that church, this is Hosea Church. a good name for a church, right? Raleigh, North Carolina. Pastor David. Uh, uh, I memorized this. Birayujel. Birayujel. Can we pray? Whatever. Pastor David, we'll call him that. Lord, let your mercy and grace be on this church and let the Holy Spirit work through them and may they fulfill the purposes of God for which that church was planted in Jesus' name. May they not defer to the left or to the right. May they follow the word of God. May they follow the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Lord, let your hand of mercy be on the pastor, David, there. I guess that's him there. And on the uh, members of the congregation, may they be used to reach their community for Jesus. And we just agree with them for the purposes of God to be fulfilled in Hosea Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. If you agree with that, say, I agree. Amen. All right, turn to greet somebody and tell them hi, and we'll keep moving. I, uh, God changed my message. I had it all ready, all polished, all ready to go Thursday, and then zip, there I go. You, you know, you just talk to the Lord, he'll talk back. 
And he said, I want you to change. So I did. So today I want to talk to you about, and I won't get through. So let me put that disclaimer on it. Established, being established in righteousness. How many know that you, have, you, have, you are righteous in Christ Jesus? So before I even get, go to this subject, let me mention, uh, ask you a few questions. I actually have notes. You can go to uh, my notes uh, online and actually look at them. I usually don't share everything. I'm sure I won't get to everything today. But I ended my notes with some action points as I normally do because how many know you don't just need to hear but you need to put into practice God's word, right? Uh, but here's what I ended my message with So uh, online, the notes. Uh, so let me start with uh, the end. Uh, are you challenged with guilt, condemnation, and inferiority? A lot of people are. Uh, are you confident, secondly, in your relationship with God? Or at times, do you question where you stand with him? Third question, do you experience peace in your relationship with Jesus? Or do you still struggle with thoughts and feelings um, of insecurity? And then lastly, fourthly, are you established in your right standing with God, living with a confidence in God that produces stability? in your personal relationship. Did you know your relationship with Jesus will affect your personal relationships? Did y'all know that? Did you know it'll affect your marriage? Do you know it'll affect how you work? Do you know it'll affect your friendships? Do you know it'll affect what, people, what, what you do about what people say about you? It'll affect all of that. So, you know, let me mention this. As we head into our future I think that one of the most fundamental foundations that we have in life is to be able to trust God and know that he's always there. And as Proverbs says, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother and he loves you immensely. Yes or no? You need to know that God is for you and not against you. Proverbs 28.1 uh, when I came across this scripture as a teenager, when I first came to Jesus, it, it really uh, it got my attention. Proverbs 28.1 says, the wicked flee. When no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. I like that. Do you like that? I went on a safari in 2005 and I was in an open truck. They had no roof on the truck and no windows on the sides. And so we're, we're going through the Serengeti Plains, which is one of the largest plains in the world. And, uh, and, and here come a pride of lions. And, and can I just be real with you? I didn't like it. Because those dudes were big, and then I had heard one of them growl, and they growl from their belly, and they can, and you can hear their sound long distances. So when this dude started walking by me, he never, he never missed a step. That lion, he probably come within uh, ten feet of our truck, right beside me. And so you know, I, I'm gonna act like a bug on the windshield. <laughs> I'm gonna sit inert, and he's he walk. I, I never even moved my head. I just followed him with my eyes until I couldn't follow him anymore. Because that dude was bold now. He was, his gait said, you mess with me, you won't ever forget me. And I might be the last thing you see. That's what it was. So the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. How, would, how many would like to have boldness in your life? Now, boldness and arrogance are two different things. Yes or no? You can be humble and at the same time be bold in God. And then this scripture really got me, Isaiah 54 uh, 14 says, in righteousness, you shall be established. Everybody say the word established. You shall be far from oppression for you will not fear and from terror, it shall not come near you. So that phrase grabbed me uh, this week as I was seeking the Lord one day. In righteousness, you will be established. Now often, I'm a, I love words. I love words. And I've always loved words. I aced English, literature, anything like that. All through my uh, school years, I just always loved words. Synonyms. Synonyms are words that mean something similar to a particular word, right? So I like the word, the synonyms for established. Again, in righteousness, you will be established. So what does it mean to be established in righteousness? How about deep-rooted? How about entrenched? How about fixed? How about ingrained? Permanent, rooted, secure, set, settled, stable, unshakable, well-established. Does that sound like something that's a foundation for life? So, so are you founded 
in how God sees you in Christ Jesus. That fundamentally is the most important thing that you will do in your relationship with Jesus is knowing what he thinks about you. So I want to talk to you today about the free gift of righteousness. I won't get through. We'll see how far we get. But the definition for righteousness that I got many, many years ago, in fact, uh, uh, SXW Kenyon was born in 1860, and uh, died in the late 40s, and he was a man beyond his time. And I have read all of his books, many of them multiple, multiple, multiple times. There's one I've probably read over 100 times in 47 years because he talks about the truths of who you are in Christ. You can find his books on Amazon or other book distributors. You can also find them now in digital form. But uh, uh, he had a definition for righteousness many years ago when I read one of his books. He's got one called The Two Kinds of Righteousness. And that, de that definition that he gave was just choice. And he said righteousness is the ability to stand before God. Watch this. Without the sense of guilt, hmm, condemnation, or inferiority, just as though you had never done wrong. Whoa. Now let me ask you a question honestly. Can you stand before God just as though you had never done wrong? Let me tell you what the enemy does. You know, uh, First Peter, Peter said, your adversary, the devil, and he mentions a lion, this in a different way. He said he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, whom resist. You know, so when Satan comes to attack a human life, the number one avenue into human, the human person that Satan uses is your thought life. Did you know that? So we, we often hear about spiritual warfare and certainly there's a lot of spiritual warfare these days with all the crazy uh, things happening worldwide and in America. But really, you want to know the truth about it? Uh, most spiritual warfare happens between your ears, right here in your head. You can't keep thoughts from coming into your mind. So before I go very far here, let me say this. Let me tell you how Satan usually attacks a person. First of all, he'll put a thought in your mind and then make you think, why are you, if you're the really the, the nice person that you say you are, what are you doing with that kind of thought in your mind? How many have had that happen before? See, that hap may happen multiple times a day. And one of my mentors in the Lord, Kenneth Hagan, who went to be with Jesus in 2003 at age 86, um, I think he actually got this quote from uh, Martin Luther. Martin Luther said, and he would say it constantly, Kenneth Hagan. He said, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep him from building a nest in your hair. I like that. And see, when I think about that, it reminds me I was a little boy one time, and, and here I just drove up to my grandmother uh, Horton's house, and, uh, and she come down the steps so excited to see her grandsons, my brother and I, and this was in the mid-60s, and she come down the steps, and, and here come a bird right over her head, and he just landed one right on her cheek. Yeah. So she couldn't keep that from happening. She just wiped it off, but she could keep him from building a nest in her hair, right? So you, what, is the, what am we saying? You can't keep thoughts from coming into your mind. You often may have thoughts come into your mind that your heart resents, yes or no? And, and you've got to determine what you do with thoughts when they come into your mind. There's, there's all kinds of thoughts these days, and there's lots of uh, things that... that there are lots of reasons you have all kinds of faults. There's lots of information that we're being barraged with on a constant basis from the internet, from all kinds of electronic gadgetry. And I've noticed that people have very little time of solace or quietness. Have you noticed that? When I ride my bike on the Noose River Trail or when I take walks and I walk two or three miles a day usually and when I do and I get off on the trail or wherever I may be, I usually see people that are listening to something. And many times somebody on a bicycle will have a beatbox. And they're just, you know, letting the music go. And, but they're not, not having a much quiet time with their minds. It's hard to grow spiritually and move forward in God without having some solace. Did you hear what I just said? A lot of people are afraid to get quiet because of what they hear inside. A lot of people run, and I'm getting ahead of myself a little, but I've just run with the Holy Ghost. 
A lot of people have uh, issues that they don't want to deal with. And the way they keep from dealing with them is just don't get quiet. Because the moment they get quiet, they get edgy. Because the issues rise up. If you want to grow in God, you got to have some quiet place time. Why? Because, because that's where you figure out where your thoughts come from. You know, when I was a young man, I came to Jesus when I was almost 18. And I struggled with, you know, myself in my, and I'm talking about this because this is something I had to deal with. It was, a, it was a revolution in my life to find out that I was righteous. Nobody ever told me that. And, uh, and, and so um, uh, because of just the way I lived, I got on drugs and all the things that go with that and the people that you yeah, um, associate with of that kind of lifestyle and in my community and in my neighborhood, it, the drugs were in my church, in my school, in my friends that I rode my bicycle with before I even got a driver's license. And so all of that. And so I had lots of memories of things I said, things I did, things I wish I'd never seen. When I came to Jesus, I had to deal with them, right? And so one of the most important things that I had to do as a believer, a new believer, was figure out where my thoughts were coming from because my thoughts were whipping me. I came to Jesus, I was on cloud nine, but you know, not long after that, that reality set in. The same old thoughts I had three years, ago, three years before started creeping back up, Right? And, and then hey, listen to this. You ever had this happen? You're, you're somewhere, maybe you're in a familiar territory, a place you've lived for a while. You've had some experiences in a certain place. And all you've got to do is, is be driving down a road and see a tree. And that tree reminds you of something that happened. You ever done that? Or, or you'll have a, a section of town, a business or a restaurant or, or a park or some place that you've been. And, and your mind takes you back five years ago or 10 years ago, according to how old you are. 20 years ago, and there you were, and there's what you were doing. Or you can see somebody's visage, that a silhouette of somebody. Maybe you're in the airport, or maybe you're in a store, and you just, you know, you're doing your stuff, and you look up, and then this person reminds you of somebody you knew 10 years ago. And then what you did with somebody you knew 10 years ago, right? That's how thought association works in a millisecond of time for all of us. Or, or, or the olfactory glands in your nose. I have an acute nose like a dog. Maybe not quite that bad, but I can smell most anything. And, uh, and so I don't know how many times I've just smelled a certain smell. And it reminded me of way back. Do you hear me? Did you know that happens constantly? Do you know that what, that is what hinders most believers in their walk with God because they don't discipline their minds when the thoughts come in, right? Satan's number one avenue of attack is through your thoughts. If you can learn to curtail your thoughts or to control your thinking. Now, I'm getting off, but I feel the Spirit of God. So just listen to me a minute. This is in my book, Change Your Mind, Change Your Life. It's on the shelf out in the foyer. If you don't have it, go get a copy. And if you don't have the money, I'll give it to you free. I just want you to have it. But just listen to me a minute. You know, if you can conquer your thinking, if you can control your thoughts, you can keep the enemy from coming into your life. Did you know that? The more you let your thoughts go uncontrolled, the more out of sorts your life will be. The, the less you control your thoughts, the less Jesus has control of you. Huh? That's why the apostle Paul said, I beg you, brothers, in view of all the mercies of God, Romans 12, 1, not in my notes, make a decisive dedication of your bodies, giving your bodies to God as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then verse 2 of Romans 12, he said, don't be conformed to the world. Or um, uh, J.B. Uh, Phillips' translation says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Don't be conformed by outward pressure to what everybody else is doing, but be transformed from the inside out. That word transforms the word metamorphosis. It's changed from inside. But be transformed from the inside out by the renewing of your mind, the total revamping of how you think that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Susan, I had a chair that I went to an estate sale back in 1992 and bought. Remember that chair, Susan? She got, she got upset with me because I gave it. I sold it. <laughs> but it was an old chair. We got that chair, and uh, I didn't thought it, think it would fit the decor of a new house we bought at the time. 
so I heard about it. And she's forgiven me. Right? Yeah, you already found out. I just reminded you. Look at that. You got to deal with that thought system. No. <laughs> so just listen. I'll hear about all this in a minute, right? <laughs> but every time I read that scripture, be not conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing. That word renewing means a complete revamping of the mental processes. I mean, literally changing how you think about life. And when I think about that, it reminds me of the chair that we bought. It was an old chair a lady was, uh, was going to a, a assisted living facility and she was selling all of her old furniture. This was some old furniture. This, probably, this chair was probably made in the 20s. And so we just had it. We, took, we bought some new, new fabric and took the old fabric. It was dingy and dusty and dirty and smelly. And we didn't want it in our house. So we bought some new fab fabric and had it renewed. You see, that's what got to happen to your thought life. It's hard to walk with God with an old way of thinking. Yes or no? So, so, so your mind's got to be, you know, you take, y'all take baths regularly, I'm assuming, right? I can smell you if you don't. But you need to take a regular mental bath. That's even more important than that. Please take the natural bath, but even more so the, the mental bath washed with the water of the word, Ephesians 5 says. So there's just something about renewing your mind. Say, so, well, how do you do that? You get the word of God Find the areas that you're troubled in and start reading or memorizing Scripture. Underline them, highlight them in your Bible. And now that we have electronics, put them on a certain page and then read them regularly. That's what I started doing as a young believer. And then I started figuring out where my thoughts come from. And listen to this as a new believer. I, uh, you know, I got to thinking, how, how do I know which thoughts come from me, which thoughts come from God, the Holy Spirit, and which thoughts, you know, they just come because I'm in, I'm, I'm just in, you know, um, I'm in uh, fellowship with other people and I'm just living in the culture I'm in. How do I know where the thoughts come? And here's what I thought. If I can figure out where my thoughts come from, then I can figure out when God's speaking to me. How many know it's pretty important to hear the Lord talk to you? It's really important. But, but you'll never get there unless you start working on your thought life. Now, I'm saying all of this because the weapons of our warfare, 2 Corinthians 10 says, are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Then it says casting down imaginations, or one translation says vain reasonings. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So you know what he was just talking about there? Spiritual warfare between your ears is when thoughts come to your mind that tell you you're no good, that remind you of where you were, remind you of what you did, remind you of what you said, remind you of how you failed and how you missed it. How many know that Satan is a, is a, is a master of reminding you of what you're not? Huh? And then F as a parent, you always tell your child what they're not you're not parenting properly. Yes or no? Your job as a parent is to love your kids, show them what to do, show them how to do it, and then help them do it. Yes or no? But a big part of being a parent, I don't know why I'm saying that. Holy Ghost. Big part of being a parent is encouraging your kids. Let me tell you how you can tell if you're doing a good job or not. You want to hear it? When they're grown they'll want to come back and talk to you because you won't be the authoritarian in their life long. And what you do in those young years will determine what they do with you in your older years. And I promise you, you want your kids to come see you. Did you hear me? And you want your grandkids to slap your legs and call your name. That's what mine do. They just grab my knees because I'm so tall, you know. And you want them to say, I love you. If you do it right when they're young, they'll do you right when you're old. Huh? Because sooner or later, that uh, authoritarian person will leave. And then you will only be able to, if you did it right when they're young, to be their confidant, their friend. 
you'll be a person they can trust because they know you're not going to try to tell them what to do, but you just want to be their friend and let them talk. Yes or no? So when a child is young, it's important that, that parents train them right. And so part, part of your job as a parent is to encourage your children. Yes or no? Huh? Tell them they're worthwhile. Tell them they can do it. Don't tell them, you reckon you'll ever do anything right? Don't say that. You, you ought to be saying, you know what? Good's inside of you. Jesus is inside of you. Huh? Put something in them. Don't take something out of them. In fact, in every relationship in life, did you know you ought to put something positive in people? There's enough of negative around. Would you agree? Having said that, one of my responsibilities as a pastor is to reprove, rebuke, and exhort, right? That means call it like it is. And there's a place in life for saying, you know what, dude, that's just flat out wrong. And you know what? We won't be doing that here, right? You got to have standards in your life, in your home, yes or no? Boy, I'm sure not even near my notes right now. But I feel the Holy Ghost saying something to somebody. Somebody in the room, and I think you're online too, you need to straighten up what you're doing at home. I don't care what kind of a Bible thumper you are. I don't care how many scriptures you can quote. I don't care how long and tall you can pray and how wonderful people think you are. What you really are is what you are behind closed doors. And how you really think and talk is how you talk to your spouse and your children. Yeah, that's you. That's not the pseudo you, that's the real you. The pseudo you wears a suit and puts on a mask and looks fine. Huh? But the real you is seen behind closed doors. Right? So how you doing with that? There's people in the room, you need to straighten this up. I just want to encourage you, I'm serious. Listen, we, we don't have a whole lot of time left in this life. And while your children are small, you know how many times? I, Lord, I, I never planned to even go here. Why? I can't tell you how many times I, I was thinking about it. It's funny. I was praying yesterday, and these thoughts came into my mind, but I didn't know I was going to say this. I don't know how many times I went to my children's rooms, got on my knees, and just looked them in the, in the, in the face and just said, my Daddy did it wrong. I shouldn't have said that to your mom or you or whatever. I just did it wrong. And I'm really sorry. Do you know when you do something like that, you grow in the other person's eyes? Do you know you grow in God's eyes when you're honest with yourself? And you know why we can't be honest with others, with our children, with our spouses, with our close friends, with our associates and our jobs? Often we can't be honest and call it like it is because we feel so badly about ourselves. And it's just one more thing that you feel bad about. You can't admit it. But when you know you're righteous, everything changes. Did you hear me? Satan's number one line of communication is through the brain, through the mind. If you can capture your thought life, if you can learn to govern your thinking, his days of ruling you are over. Now, I said all that because... When I was a young believer, condemnation and inferiority were a part of my life. And I was growing in God. I got filled with the Holy Spirit, came back to Jesus, got filled with the Holy Spirit, September 12th, 1976. And I began to read the Bible and I began to attend a church in my hometown. And and I even started a few months later to attend some Bible school classes at night. That's where I met Susan. Found out she was a pretty girl that was single. And the rest is history. But as I began to uh, read and pray and seek and sing and get involved with other people, other believers, these thoughts started creeping up in me of how worthless I was. And then I would have scenes of things I had done. And then I would have thoughts that said, you hadn't changed. You think you changed. You hadn't really changed. You ever had those kind of thoughts come in your mind? The thoughts that remind you of something you shouldn't have said. Now listen, I've been a believer for 47 years. Did you know I still have those kinds of thoughts come into my mind? Who do you think you are? Look at that. Look how you said that. Look how you acted there. Who do you think you are? Well, you know, if you want to know the truth, I think I'm a child of God. 
I think I'm an imperfect human being who's been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And I've been favored by God, not because of anything I've done, but because of everything he did. Did you hear me? When you start living that way, it changes who you are. Do you know if you get a hold of who you are as a righteous person in God's sight, did you know it'll transform how you relate to people? Did you know people will no longer be able to control you? If you're a, a person that's easily controlled, you're easily swayed by fear and other people's opinions. And then if you try to control other people, did you know you're likewise full of insecurity and fear? Because you're afraid of the outcome if you let another person be themselves. Let me tell you how Jesus is. Let me tell you how God the Father is. He owns all. He knows all. He sees all, but he loves you. Do you hear me? This is amazing. And he has an ability to love you and forgive you and act towards you just as though you never did wrong. See, a righteousness, the ability to stand before God as though guilt, condemnation, and inferiority had never been in your life. Think that through. What would that be like in your life if you never thought as being an inferior person to God? Now, having said that, you know, some people arrogantly say, well, God loves me and they're living in sin. How many hear me? There is no peace, says God, to the wicked. Their life is like the troubled sea. You can say, I have peace with God, but you're living in sin. There's no way. You're trembling on the inside. I was, one day, I remember, I was, I was high as a kite smoking pot as a teenager. And on the inside of me, I just had an inner knowing. I was saying like, oh my God, what if I get caught? What if the police catch me? What if the principal of the school catches me? What am I going to say to my parents? What's going to happen to me? Am I going to be put in? I was constantly, constantly agitated. If you're not walking with God, listen, you are agitated. And when the pressures of life come, that agitation can be really strong. Did you know that? A few times in my life, y'all okay? I'm just wandering around here. This is not my normal way, but I feel like it. A few times in my life, I have been absolutely alone. That is, when I travel to other nations, many of you have done that. If you've been in the armed services or your job has taken you to other cultures, other lands, and, uh, and you're by yourself, traveling by yourself. I've many times traveled on long-haul flights alone, gone through airports alone. Uh, thank God the attendants at the you know, gates and such were trained to speak English, but I'm in a completely foreign land. I've been to hotels, and the only person that sp spoke English was moi, me. <laughs> That's it. You turn in a TV on, radio on, it's another language. You'd, and, and, and during those times, you feel completely alone. Have you ever felt completely alone? Well, let me tell you what happens when you feel completely alone. You find out who you are real fast. And you find out what your value systems are. Did you hear me? And you find out what, you, what your inner strength is when you're by yourself. Did you know that? It's true. If you've never been alone, you don't know yourself well yet. But I can tell you in those alone times, somebody rose up inside of me and he happened to be the Holy Spirit. And you know what he would do? He would remind me of the promises of God and remind me that I'm with the Lord and I have a good standing with him. Do you know that makes all the difference in the world? In our future, great darkness is coming. Listen to me. I don't like what I have to say, but there's some terrible things coming to the United States of America that we've never experienced before. I can't even tell you how, when it's going to happen. I can't tell you exactly what it looks, look like, looks like. I can tell you I can tell you lots of things about it, but I can just say it's not good. And see who you are inside comes shining through when the pressure points come. So who are you? That's why righteousness, knowing who you are, will make all of the difference when tough times come. Right? You know, I traveled uh, with a, a missionary, Bruce McDonald. Uh, in fact, he told me over the 
I don't know, I traveled with him maybe uh, 15, 16 years, uh, sometimes a couple of times a year, several weeks at a time. And he finally told me I, was, uh, I had traveled more with him than any other pastor. And then he told me there were people, we, that we would go to some pretty, uh, you know, tough places, no, no running water, no electricity. Nobody could speak your language. And then you've been with me, you know, you know what it's like. But he said there are certain places and that the demonic world was strong in some of those places. And he would find, he, he at times found pastors who just lost their mental equilibrium or, or businessmen that went with him. See, when the pressure comes, who you are inside shows up. 1998, November 1, there was a plane crash, a ministry that we support. And I was one of the people, some of you in the room may have been there too. We had eight people from our church there. The plane crashed. And the most unusual thing that I saw was people actually hallucinated because the pressures, the mental and emotional pressures of knowing people they worked with for a whole, for a whole week in a, in, a, in a deserted place ministering the gospel were on that plane and died. And when that, when that news came to the campus that I was on, in Susan was with me. She remembers. Uh, pe people were hallucinating, and really just kind of lost it mentally. You know, and, and most of the most of them were new believers who who really weren't solidly grounded in who they were in Jesus. Did you hear what I'm just saying? Now that's why the most important thing you're going to do, I said in a roundabout way, is control your thinking and know who you are. Right. So what mental challenges do you face? Some thoughts come from the devil. How do you know? Well, he usually has an accusing voice. Who do you think you are? Or how could you? Or who said? It's accusatory. He's often accusatory, right? He came to Jesus accusing him. Huh? You're hungry, right? Turn that stone into bread. You're, you're, you're a big old God, right? Throw yourself up in the pinnacle of the temple and throw yourself off. Huh? It's a sneery kind of a thought. It's the enemy. Anything that seeks to drag you down. Now, sometimes human beings can be used by the devil to drag you down. Yes or no? Let me just say you're being used as a tool of the enemy if you, if you tell and remind people of their past on a constant basis. Husbands, if you talk, constantly tell your wife what they're not and what they didn't do, how many times they didn't do it, you're being used as a tool of the devil. A lot of wives said, that's right. <laughs> and then ladies, the same way. Your man comes in the door. All he needs is a, an attaboy. You doing good, son? Come on. Good boy. I love you, hub. But if you tell him he forgot to take out the trash and the yard hadn't been cut in two weeks and, you know, there's a crack over there in the wall that you need to fix and that room needs painting. And when's the last time you checked the car? There's a light on on the dashboard. What you going to do, boy? How many know you're not helping him, you're hurting him? Yes or no? Having said that, husbands, you need to be man, man up and you need to listen if she says something, right? Huh? You know, righteousness will enable you to be honest and upright and fair with everybody and treat them with respect and kindness even when you disagree. Amen. Yes or no? Well, I don't know how I wandered into all that, but I did. I'm talking about your thought life. How's your thought life doing? I think we need to clean up. What do you think? Huh? I mean, how about this? Do you take, let me ask you some questions. Do you have some times throughout the day that you just muse, that is, you think? Do you have times during the day that you think out loud? You say, what do you mean? Well, do you meditate the word of God? Huh? Do you have times during the day when you cut the radio off in the car? Or caught the MP3 player off in the car. I've got one in my truck. And I listen to stuff constantly. But there are times I just sit back. Yesterday, I took almost a three-mile walk. And I thought I was going to listen to a podcast, but I ended up talking to the Lord and, and thinking about Scripture. Do you hear me? And there's sometimes I go on a long-distance bicycle ride. I think, well, I'm going to listen to this particular book because I've got online books you can listen to, you know. I said, well, I'll listen to that. And instead, I've spent the whole time just meditating. I spend some time just about every night. I don't know. I wake up about 3 o'clock every night. And I don't count sheep because there are no sheep to count. 
But you know what I do? I let Scripture revolve over and over. I just sometimes start with the book of Matthew and go through the whole book. Or sometimes it'll be a theme. Scripture's on faith. Scripture's on healing. Scripture's on forgiveness. Scripture's on mercy. Scripture's on faith. Or sometimes I just go through a book of the Bible and scriptures that I know and have memorized. I just let them go through my head. And what, what am I doing when I do that? Meditating. What will meditation do? Well, you know, it'll straighten you out inside. And it'll create an environment of peace and an environment of right standing with God inside. Yes or no? It's amazing. I had seven points I was supposed to get to. I hadn't even given you the first one yet. <laughs> How many think the Holy Spirit's talking to you? What are you doing with your thought life, guys? Seriously, we all need to deal with it. There is an, a barrage of thoughts that are coming from the enemy. He's using people, he's using entities, he's using businesses, he's using music, he's using all kinds of things. Media outlets, individuals, and it's constantly, constantly um, uh, beating on you. What are you doing with it? If you're not counteracting it, you're imbibbing it. Yes or no? If you're doing nothing with it, it's getting inside of you and it's changing your thought patterns. Have you ever thought this or had somebody say this to you? I thought that person was a believer. How could they be saying that? Or how could they be acting that way? Well, I'll tell you how. They've done nothing with what's in their thought life. Huh? All of us are the same. There is this thing called righteousness, the ability to stand before God. Everybody okay? Okay. Without the sense of guilt, condemnation, inferiority, just as though <coughs> you had never done wrong. It's a free gift. How many know it's not in? Earn. Now, here's my first point. Let's see if I can get past the first one. The main enemy of your relationship with Jesus is guilt and condemnation. Right? Do you wrestle with guilt? Wrestle with condemnation. You've heard me say this before. Psychologists say the number one demotivator of human personality is condemnation and guilt. It's the number one demotivator. It keeps people from doing what they perhaps could do. Yes or no? And then spiritually speaking, guilt and condemnation will pull the rug out from under you spiritually. Did you know that? It's kind of hard to relate to a person. Do, do you like to be around people who are constantly cutting you down? Let me ask you, do you like to be around somebody who, who the way they talk to you is kind of sarcastic in tone and, and, and the way they phrase things, you know, it sounds okay, but underneath the surfaces they make you feel like they don't think you're doing what you should be doing? You ever been around a person like that? How many just enjoy having lunch with somebody else? Would you please raise your hand? No, nobody likes that. Uh, maybe that's why, maybe that's why uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas is challenging at home. When all the relatives come, huh? The family tree comes. There's squirrels in every family tree, right? And then, and then you know, you just don't want to be on one certain person. They're just always telling you what you're not or showing you how much better you, they are than you. Now, you know, take that over into your relationship with the Lord. If you think the Lord is in any way, I'm just trying to look for a simple, miffed, upset, agitated, not quite pleased with you, did you know you won't go talk to him? Or you'll rarely do so? Or if you do, it'll be really quiet and like, it's a real struggle, right? That, 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 that's the way it is. So, uh, you know, let me say this. I, I was raised in church 18 years, almost. And what I heard constantly at church is what, was that I was a sinner saved by grace. Y'all ever heard that? Well, I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. I heard that all my life. I heard it on Sundays. I heard it from the head deacon, the second deacon, the third deacon, the tenth deacon. I heard it from a Sunday school teacher. I heard it from the pastor. I heard it from all kinds of people at church. You're a sinner saved by grace. And, and, and the basis for that was Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we all are like an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness says, are like filthy rags as as. We all fade as a leaf. Our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Our, your righteousness is as filthy rags. And I'd hear, well, my righteousness is like a dirty rag. I'm just like a dirty rag. Well, I don't like dirty rags. I throw them in the washing machine. Clean those rags or throw them away. Huh? No, no, it's not my righteousness. It's something Jesus gave to me. 
My righteousness means nothing. My good works mean nothing. But you know what? When you find out what he did, it makes all the difference in the world, right? I never heard. I never heard the term. Did you know you are the, you are the righteousness of God in Christ? I never heard the term until I was 18 years old. I never in my whole life heard that. Here's what I began to think after I really came to Jesus and really understand the word of God. Here's what I learned to say. I was a sinner. I got saved by grace. And now I've been made the righteousness of God in him. How many of you are believers? Raise your hand. I want you to say this out loud and, and, and notify yourself as to what it feels like when you say it. Say it. Because of Jesus... All of my sins have been cleansed. To him, it is as though I had never done wrong. I have been made righteous. I have an ability to stand before God just as though I had never done wrong. Now, how does that feel inside? Doesn't that lift you up? How often do you say that about yourself? You say, well, if I said that about myself, it'd be back braggadocious. Well, who are you bragging on? It's not your righteousness that somebody gave you. It's Jesus' righteousness that he gave to you. And there's nothing wrong with bragging on Jesus. Every time I say I've been made the righteousness of God in him. In fact, when the enemy says, remember, remember Mitch? Remember you were preaching 33 years ago in the church that you started in the small town in South Carolina? Remember when you stuck both size 13 uh, shoes in your mouth at the same time and said something really dumb? And then everybody looked at you with a poker face like, what is that pastor saying? You remember, remember that? You know better than that right now. Did you know when the enemy says that or other things to me, you know what I say? Well, that may have happened way back then, but you know what? To God, it never happened. And to God, he has no record of what I did wrong. And to me, it's as though it never happened because to God, it's as though it's never happened. So shut up and get out of here. I've been made the righteousness of God in him. God has forgiven and cleansed all my sin. Yes or no? Knowing this is, hey, I get to point two. What it says, knowing that you're righteous in Christ can give you an inward confidence that will boost your spiritual life and enable, and enable you to do six things. You want to hear what they are? Six things. Number one, if you know that you're righteous, you can live with a confidence that God is for you and not against you. Now, what will that do in the challenges of life? You won't run from God, you'll run to him. When you make a mistake, you won't run from him, you'll run to him. Right? Yeah. Second thing it'll do is you'll be free. It'll enable you to be free from self-condemnation and guilt. I'm going to come back to that one in a minute. Thirdly, you'll be released from your past failures and mistakes. How many times throughout the day you think about what you could have, should have, or would have done? How many times throughout the day you think of what you used to do or you have done and it brings some angst to your life, right? I mean, can I just get real? I mean, if you've been divorced and you were the problem, I'm just going to tell you, you think about that a lot. Or if you've sinned with a bunch of people, I'm just going to tell you, you, that comes up to your mind. You can't keep thoughts from coming into your mind, but you can do something with them when they come. And that's where righteousness comes into play. When you know that God, when he forgives, he absolutely forgets your past and he acts towards you as though you never did anything wrong. That's better than you're saying. Did you hear me? He acts towards you just as though you never sinned. Is that good or what? There is no psychologist that can impart that to you. Huh? There is nothing you can do. There's no program you can take to absolve the guilt sense because of the things we've said or done like the blood of Jesus can. Hebrews 10, 17, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Isaiah 43, 25, I even I am he who blots out your transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember your sins. Micah 7, 19, he's cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Corey Ten Boone said, don't go fishing. <laughs> right? Isn't that good? So how much does that come up into your mind? See, when, these, when the enemy tries to remind you of your thoughts, or, or your past, and he brings them up into your thought life. You need to remind him, you know, to God, it's just as though I never did that. 
<clears throat> Number four, you'll be able to approach God with the innocence of a child. What do children do when they see you? What do your grandkids do when they come up and see you? They call me, hey, pop, poppy, poppy. <laughs> Ready or not, they're gonna jump in my arms. Same way with Gigi over here, right? Huh? Do you, can you do that way with God? Next thing that'll happen is you'll be able to have a, exercise consistent faith in the most trying circumstances. Righteousness will do that. You know what the last thing will happen when you're righteous? You'll be, you will not be swayed when people criticize you. People can say what they want to say about you, but you know what? You know what God the Father thinks about you. And when you know what he thinks about you based on his word, and his word is forever settled in heaven, people can bat their gums and say anything they want to say. But you know what? As far as I'm concerned, what Jesus says is more important. Yes or no? You know, I, I and I have mentioned this many times, I, I am guilty of having an obsessive mind. And any person that is a leader, they're constantly thinking on certain things. So I constantly, in fact, I usually overthink most everything because I'm looking, I'm looking under every rock, looking behind every tree, so to speak, looking at everything, looking at, at a particular issue and looking at all the sides of it. So I'm constantly thinking. So I do obsess in my thought life. That is, I let things go over and over and over in my mind. Do you ever do that? In fact, I don't know how many times I've said something to someone and then I've examined it for about 30 minutes now I could have said it that way or could have said it that way or should have said it that and then that nuance on their face told me this and I should have done then what's going to happen with that right if you have an obsessive thinking if you have it then you could allow that to turn into self-condemnation and inferiority if you're not careful and you know for me when I was young I was my worst critic now and a lot of that I have dealt with but I have to tell you sometimes uh, I can those thoughts come back and I still have to do the same things I did 40 something years ago I have to make a choice not to think on them is that correct guilt demotivates it creates a spiritual downward spiral when I was young I mean, these thoughts will come and that I'm, I've done this or that. So, so why would God even want to have anything to do with me? And the thought was, I can never do right, so why try? If that's a part of your life, get a hold of who you are in Jesus, right? A lot of people try to escape the pressures that they sense on the inside because of the guilt and the condemnation they sense in lots of different ways. Some people uh, imbib alcohol, some drugs, some over-the-counter medications. Other people, you know, other people use, uh, use work. They just get overly busy so that they don't think about what they're, they're feeling on the inside. They don't think about the guilt. They don't think about the condemnation. They don't think about the coulda, shoulda, will. They just let it all go and they just and they just become numb, right? Hmm. You know, I've even noticed that uh, since I've been with Jesus since 1976, so sometimes a person can be one of the hardest workers at church. And one of the reasons they're the hardest workers is they don't want to get quiet and don't want to have any downtime where they, they have time to think because when they do that, guilt and condemnation comes, right? Again, all of these things could be reasons and ways that people numb the pain of guilt, of condemnation. So, you know, uh, for me, when I came to Jesus, oh, I'd known the Lord maybe six months or so, maybe, maybe, maybe more like, well, maybe a year. It's more like a year because it was the fall of the year. Well, we had these, uh, we had these uh, uh, oak trees in our front yard, and they had, you know, the oak leaves with the uh, oak trees with the little small leaves. So it was the fall of the year, so it had to be September, October, and the leaves had fallen in our front yard. I was still living at my parents' house. I had a day off, and I was in school, and then I also uh, worked, and I worked full-time and was in school, so I was super busy. But I had a day off one day. And let me tell you, th this was my psych, and, and so I was so busy that on my day off, instead of going out and doing something that was fun, my spiritual life took over, and you know what I did? I got in my room, shut the door, and I was reading my Bible. Then I was reading a book. And you say, well, there's nothing wrong with reading the Bible. You know, there's, there's really nothing wrong with reading the Bible. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with reading the book unless you're doing it for the wrong reason. And I was laying in my room, and the windows were up in my bedroom, and I heard, shh, 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 somebody raking the front yard. And I heard something inside and I recognized it was the voice of the Lord. 
I said, Mitch, I want you to put your book up. I want you to close your Bible and go out there and help, help rake the yard. I said, I don't want to rake the yard. I want you to go rake the yard. And I said, well, don't you like what I'm doing? I want you to go rake the yard. He didn't say anything about what I was doing. You know why? I was reading my Bible to feel right with God. I was, I was reading the book so I would feel right, like I was doing something to earn my standing with God. Let me go a step further. When I first came to Jesus, I had fast days every week. I'd fast like Tuesdays, Thursdays. I was fast all day. And I had a hard job too. I was working in the grocery store as a little boy, you know, 18 years old, 19 years old. And it was tough physical labor. But I would eat nothing all day. And I thought, God, you, you know, must be pretty proud of me. You like me, right? <laughs> there's everybody else and then there's me, you know. You know, God, you need a lot of people like me. I mean, how stupid is that, right? And you know what God said to me? Mitch, I want you to stop fasting because it's not doing you any good because that's your righteousness, not mine. So if you've got to do something to be right with God, you got the wrong stuff going on, my friend. How many hear what I just said? So laying on that bed that, that day I had that day off, I shut my book, I shut my Bible, I put my jacket on and put my shoes on and went outside and uh, I helped my mother rake the yard. And God taught me a big lesson. Now every time I rake my yard, you know, it, it reminds me, you can't do to be. You have to accept who you are. Is that good? Titus 3, 4, and 5, but with kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared when it appeared. Not by works of righteousness we have done, but by his mercy. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. How many know Jesus wants you to be free of condemnation? I got all these notes that are staring at me, but I think I'm going to stop right now because I think I've said a lot. What do you think? How you doing with your thought life? What are you doing? Get a hold of who you are in Jesus. I'll come back to this next week. I got a whole lot to say about what Jesus did for us and what righteousness will do for you and what it produces in you. Can I encourage you to do, go on a journey with me? What if, you took, um, what if you took 10 minutes every day? Oh, it's five minutes. And, and cut everything off and just got quiet and got two scripture. And just let them, and just said them out loud over and over again. Question, what do you think that would do for you? I'll tell you what it'll do. It will start changing you. Did you hear me? Go back to my notes. Thank God for your right standing with him. We're going to get into this a little further next week. 2 Corinthians 5.21 is one of the verses I'm sure we'll probably cover. For he made him, God, made him Jesus to be sin for us, who knew no sin that we may, might be made right with God through him. See, when God made you righteous in Jesus, two things happened. He completely forgave everything that you've ever done. Because when Jesus went to the cross, he completely owned who you are. Your drug addictions, huh? Your lusts, your nasty words, your vulgar thoughts, your prideful dispositions, huh? Your selfish tendencies, right? Huh? Your sexual exploitations, Jesus became that for you. Him who knew no sin was made to be our sin sacrifice. Woohoo! Jesus took it. I used to could curse pretty good. Jesus took all that. Isn't that great? I used to lust. Jesus took all that. I was just chuck full of pride. Jesus took all that. Is that good stuff? And think about you. Who have you been? Jesus took who you were. Watch. And he didn't stay there and just forgive you. He let you become who he is. Him who knew no sin was made to be our sin. 
One translation says our sin sacrifice. That we might be made right with God. Or we might become the righteousness of God. Righteousness, two connotations. Maybe we'll get to it. We'll see how far. I might have to go several weeks on this. Well, it's okay. Righteousness has two connotations. Justification means Jesus took your sin. Jesus did everything. He became who you were. And he was judged by God for what you did. Right? Right? And so that means, that means God completely forgets what you did. When God forgives, how many know he completely forgets your past? Is that good stuff? The longer you live, the bigger past you have. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Jesus let it all go. But he doesn't leave you there. The second thing he does is positive. He lets you be who he is, righteous. He gives you an ability to stand before God just like him. Him who knew no sin. And he lets you stand before God just as though you never sinned. Is that good? That we could become the righteousness of God in him. Think of it. Wow. That means when you pray, it's just as though you'd never done wrong. So you say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I need to talk. He'll say, what is it, son? What is it, daughter? Right? That's how he tr treats you, right? Now, your mind will tell you who you think you are. Remember what you said the other night? Remember how you treated your spouse? Remember what you said? Remember what you did, right? No, God forgets if you confess your sins, right? There's a whole lot more here than I'm able to say today, but did you get what I said today? If you can get a hold of this, it transforms your life. I'm not kidding. And that way, every time you have a challenge, every time you have a problem, instead of running from God, you run right to him. I, I, I can just tell you it's a great way to live. Huh? This side of heaven, you're probably not going to reach ultimate perfection, although you ought to keep changing and getting better. Yes Amen. or no? Amen. But when you do wrong, we have an attorney with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Is that good news? Ow! I like it. So there are people that you are yet to affect, yet to meet. And then there are people in your home that you talk to every day. It may be your spouse, your children. And then there are people you text on a regular basis. It might be your children that are grown. It might be your grandchildren. Every person that you see, God wants you to be a positive influence on them. The way that you become a positive influence is know the positiveness that Jesus placed in you when he died for you and was raised from the dead. Did you hear what I just said? You get, we, now's the time to be rooted and grounded in that, right? Huh? I got more to say. I got all these points and what I'm about to say will be covered in the points whenever we get to them. But if everything I'm saying and you're feeling like, I just feel like a louse. Well, you know what? If you're living in sin, you're not going to feel right. A lot of believers today have given themselves permissions to do wrong. And the Holy Spirit's grieved in them. And when the Holy Spirit's grieved, you won't have the sense of joy. And you won't have the sense of peace. And you won't have the, the sense of acceptance from Jesus. Did you hear me? He's the one that brings that to you. And if you say things that grieve him and do things that grieve him, he'll just be quiet. Does he leave? I didn't say he left. He just gets quiet. He's grieved. In fact, that's why Paul said in Ephesians 4, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed. Right? So if you're here, you're watching online, you've grieved the Holy Spirit. Because you you're involved in things that you know will, will hurt you, not help you. But you know what? you can still come to God and repent. Is that good news? Or you may be here today in the room or you may be watching and you've never embraced Jesus Christ as your Savior from your sin. You say, well, what if I don't? Well, then you'll spend eternity in a place called the lake of fire. There is a hell, there's a heaven. And I can tell you, life can be snuffed out very rapidly. I've, uh, I've, I've said this many times. I've come close to death six times 
And every single time I've come close to death, I tell you, I didn't know it was coming at the moment. It suddenly happened upon me. And the first thing you think about is your relationship with the Lord. I can tell you right now, that's the first thing you think about. That happened two times before I knew the Lord. And I said, oh God, please don't let me go to hell. Please, please, oh God, please. That's the first thing I thought. After I knew Jesus and that, and that experience came, well, my first thought was, is it time for me to go into eternity? Because I knew I was right with the Lord, right? Right? So how about you? Are you right with God? Somebody said you're not ready to live until you're ready to die. Huh? If you're ready to die, you know what? You'll do anything God tells you to do anywhere he tells you to do it. And you'll be bold as a lion. Because you know if God be for you, who can be against you?